Now we look at uh, some of the tanker losses and with tankers, other than loss of life you're, and uh, cargo, you're also looking at a huge amount of environmental damage. So the Torrey Canyon in 1967, and this directly led to the adoption of marble. So you're looking at 120,000 tons of spillage in the English Channel. Uh, the Argo merchant was smaller. Amoko Cadiz was a big one, 223. Although it is not the biggest in history. I think the biggest in history is about 250,000 tons. The Amoko Cadiz I will talk of again later because that led to a regulation which was not directly related to oil spillage because you had a look at uh, uh, steering, steering gear, really. Exxon Valdez, uh, I don't need to tell you guys, I mean, this is what uh, started the whole thing about the double hull, and in this case it was uh, also because of the nature of the spill, the location of the spill, and the huge amount of coverage it got over the uh, world media, because, I mean, I, I don't remember that in 1976 there was such a hue and cry about maybe that vessel Argo Merchant, you know. But, um, and, and, and many of these other spills that took place, I, I was talking about the largest spill which is 250,000, I don't see much about it in the media. Or if you go back to the media at that time. So the Amoko Kadis, the, I'm sorry, the Exxon Valdez, this uh, put a lot of pressure on the U.S. government and they felt they had to act immediately and they kind of pushed it through. Uh, there was a lot of, in the industry, there were a lot of alternate proposals which were uh, on the anvil. They were saying we'll have a mid-deck uh, kind of tanker where you have a um, transverse deck across the, fuel, uh, across the cargo tanks, which in case of damage would kind of limit the, limit the outflow of oil. Uh, there was also something called hydrostatic balance loading, whereby the uh, tank uh, design would be such that in case of a breach of the hull, the hydrostatic head of the tank, of the oil in the tank, would match that of the water outside. So you would not really have any um, outflow of oil. Or if it flowed out, it would be minimal. But uh, the industry didn't have so much time to really go into all these aspects because the U.S. government um, enacted the OPA Oil Pollution Act of 1990 and uh, stipulated the double hulls from now on. And basically IMO followed suit and all the other countries had to actually go through because a large amount of trade, world trade, is to, to the U.S. So. Then, of course, you had the Erika in 1999 of Brittany, where uh, 30,000 tons, and uh, they decided to accelerate the phase-out dates. There were some phase-out dates specified earlier, but they decided to accelerate it, and uh, I think they came up to a date of 2010, and then after the prestige happened, they wanted to accelerate it uh, further. Presently, I think uh, it's up to 2015 or 25 years of age, whichever comes earlier. CAS is uh, really what is called a condition assessment scheme that came into Marpool, which is somewhat similar to what we do on a special survey, except that there have certain specific requirements which are in excess. And part of it is to do with maybe some additional girth belts to be taken in way of uh, uh, for thickness gauging and uh, also to do with some fatigue analysis and, and the whole uh, report is probably a little more comprehensive. Just to look at Amoko Kadiz again, I said this one was different because uh, this one didn't talk of oil spillage, this one talked about steering gear because uh, this was a super tank owned by Amoko running aground on Portsal Rocks, three miles off Brittany. Brittany is in France, resulting in the fifth largest oil spill in history, and it was traveling from Persian Gulf to Le Havre. And um, a seemingly minor failure in its steering gear started a slow drift to the coastline and where she ran aground. So this uh, brought about uh, a regulation in SOLAS to do with single failure criteria. That means no single failure, cri uh, no single failure in its piping or valves should allow the steering gear to become operational. And 
as it happens with most regulations, I mean, it comes, it came in as for tankers, but now, because, I mean, it's like people don't make steering gears just for, a tank, for tankers, um, it's, it's spread to other, other, kinds of, other kinds of vessels as well. Dabisha, this is a very famous one, and uh, this, strangely, was, uh, this happened in 1984, sorry, 1980, and she was built in 1976. So she was, she was a cape-sized vessel. She was only four years old. And uh, it could not have been structural wastage that led to her sinking. Uh, she was the largest vessel of her type at that time. 965 feet long, 145 feet wide. Um, and last of a series of six vessels. Okay, so it was not like it was the first of the design which uh, was therefore an unproven or untested design. There was no distress signal and 42 British crew and officers and two wives on board were never found. Sister vessels were found with cracks around frame 65 just forward of the cargo area where longitudinal members terminated. So what exactly led to the loss was, uh, was the subject of an investigation that took 20 long years. And uh, finally, around 2001, the committee concluded its findings and made some recommendations for bulk carrier strengthening, which we will look at. There's some more description about how it happened. She was in a major typhoon system. This is off, I think, Okinawa, um, where high waves prevailed and very high waves of low probability of occurrence could have encountered and possibly exceeded the design envelope of the vessel. The vessel was fully laden with high-density cargo, two of the holds empty. Okay, now, nowadays, bulk carriers, we, we specify density of cargo to be carried. The, the, there is a specific uh, loading uh, limit to the tank tops of, uh, of the cargo holds. We uh, uh, alternate holds, I think, are more or less ruled out now, unless they've been specifically, uh, specifically designed and, and, and analyzed for alternate hole loading. And, and what, what they found from a lot of diving done on the wrecks was that the, the vessel seemed to have imploded. That means the pressure of the water from outside was too much and the hatch covers and even the side shell imploded inside. Obviously, if you have explosives, then the structure will show that it, it came out, not in. It did not implode in. The direction of the uh, fracture plating would show that. Now, this is the underwater still. This is the top of an air vent with the head missing. And uh, we don't know whether that happened when the vessel was going down or it happened in the rough seas, but it provided a clue, possible clue as to what happened to the vessel. Another picture from the, uh, again an underwater still, shows uh, some sort of uh, access way, which obviously could not have been closed, because you still had a rope going through it. And of course the cover is probably missing over here, but that might have happened later. But even if the cover had been there, it could not have been closed. So, and this was in the forecastle area, so it could have shipped in water from there. Nowadays, we look at the design of hatch covers with some actual water head on it, especially the foredeck hatch covers, the forward hatch covers, maybe hatch covers one, two. Uh, the thing is that the hatch covers were earlier designed for Weathertight integrity, really. They were not meant to be watertight. They were not supposed to withstand a head of water. But uh, typically what happens in a rough seaway for a bulk carrier of this size, when the seaways are heavy, is that when she goes under the waves, the front part gets submerged. And you might have seen pictures or stills of, uh, of vessels with the front part completely buried in the water, and it still comes up. But the loading on these hatch hatches is something that we had not adequately con 
concerned ourselves with. So Derbyshire brought this to light very starkly. So this is what I, I was talking about, the hatch cover. And the other conjecture is because, um, as you know, the, the worst uh, length of wave that a vessel can encounter is a wavelength having the same size as the length of the ship. That's when the maximum stresses can occur because the loading is the most severe at that point. So up to 1990, the Institute of Under London Underwriters declared a total of 216 bulk and combination carriers as total losses. Bulk and combination carriers. Uh, question to ask is since when? From when to 1990? Uh, basically bulk carriers came into being as a vessel type sometime around the early 50s, so around 1952, 53 or so. Before that you had general cargo carriers which carried bulk. So we are talking of from the 50s to the 90s, uh, about 216 bulk and combination carriers went down. And this started causing a lot of concern around 1990. And a further 40 bulk carriers went down 90 to 91, the loss of 300 lives. More than half the incidents were hull related. Some disappeared in rough weather, but some even in calm seas, which led uh, the IMO and the governments and class societies really look at what was happening. And what was happening was that bulk carrier designs started off with maybe, what, five, ten thousand ton bulkers. And uh, by this time, you were, you were having uh, even very, very large cape size bulk carriers and, and larger, really. Uh, you have very large over carriers and and I think the, the size has gone up today to maybe 250 or 300,000 tons. So, although the size was increasing, probably uh, not enough investigation was being made of the structural uh, ramifications of this. Uh, it was maybe existing vessels uh, extrapolated or maybe, maybe uh, they had not looked adequately at the dynamic effects. Uh, also, as, as you can see that some of these vessels went down in calm weather. So what causes the ship to go down in calm weather? Uh, possibly she encountered rough weather earlier, stresses were too much, but they've also found that some of these stresses occurred when she was loading. When you have a Cape size uh, bulker loading at some port in Brazil or, I don't know, Australia, where you're loading 15,000 tons of cargo per hour. And uh, this, and, and as you know, even while loading, stresses have to be maintained at, a, at an even level or at an acceptable level. And you can overstress in, in, a, in, in, in three minutes. In three minutes, you can reach an overstress level before you are able to stop the loading and see. So all this led to the uh, other regulations which had to do with loading and unloading sequence of bulk carriers, which also uh, became a requirement around uh, 2002. Uh, we were talking about how the number one cargo hold and the number one hatch uh, gets submerged underwater and is subject to a lot of stresses. Um, and this is what has happened to 90% of the casualties. And, and a lot of these casualties are with heavy, heavy cargo. Iron ore, steel bars. Uh, cargo that shifts in heavy weather. Some of the bulk carriers had steel rods that just punctured the hull and went out because the securing arrangements were not adequate. That again led to requirements like having a cargo securing manual on board. And when you have like bad weather, I mean, some of these bulk carriers went down even without any distress calls, you know, no, no distress messages. Because bulk carriers, when they break, they break catastrophically. When the hull girder fractures, it just breaks into two and it sinks very, very quickly. Unlike tankers, which even if they are damaged, they stay afloat for a long time because even oil has its buoyancy to some extent and it takes time for a tanker to go down. So in 1998, IACS introduced requirements of UR UR is unified requirements, uh, 19, 22, and 23, which had to do with strengthening of the bulkhead between cargo hold number one and two, where they looked at the design and said that 
these holes have never been designed for withstanding hydrostatic head of water, of the hole being flooded. Yeah, maybe number three hole in a handy sized vessel was designed to carry ballast, so maybe those were designed. Not number one, not number two, not number four or five. And as we see, if you have an accident, accidental flooding due to hatch cover failure or whatever reason of number one hole, uh, the bulkhead cannot withstand it, it collapses, number two hole floods, that collapses. So in, in very short time, the ship is down by head and sinking before you know it. So this looked at retroactive uh, reinforcement of this bulkhead, and this happened for all bulkers at that time, where uh, if they were analyzed for their present strength, so thickness gaugings were taken of these bulkheads, and if they were deficient in design, then they were asked to be reinforced either by cropping and inserting or by some sort of straps or uh, shadow plates to reduce the span. And of course, 22 and 23 had to do with, I think one was to do with the strength of the double bottom itself to withstand this head of uh, water in case it is flooded. And the other was to do with stability. Stability in the flooded condition. You will remember that uh, stability prior to that was uh, an aspect, damage stability was an aspect which was limited to passenger vessels only. After this, people started looking at damage stability of even bulk carriers, and later on this has spread to tankers and, and other types of vessels as well. This is a list of uh, some of the unified requirements, and uh, we already talked about 19, evaluation of scantlings, 22, with cargo hold flooded. These were the ones which came as a result of Derbyshire. You had S24, detection of water ingress. You had S26, which was strength and securing of small hatches on the exposed foredeck, because they found that some of these hatches, if they really were in rough weather, they wouldn't withstand either the hydrostatic head or the securing arrangements were not tight enough. So the securing arrangements and the reinforcing stiffeners below the cover, these had to be, uh, some specified minimum had to be there. So all this was stipulated in these regulations. Then you had strength of four deck fittings, S27, which you saw that ventilator with the missing head, basically it addresses strength of such ventilators so that you don't have flooding in the forward part of the ship where she's most vulnerable. S28, I think, came later, requirements of fitting a forecastle deck, fitting a forecastle for a bulk carrier, old carrier, combination carriers. Basically, this provides you a little more buoyancy, reserve buoyancy in case of damage. And then, of course, you had S31, which was to do with strengthening of side shell frames. A lot of these bulk carriers, if you look at a typical design of a bulk carrier, I don't have a board here, but Basically, you have a topside tank, which is um, prismatic in shape. You have a double bottom, which is again prismatic. And then you have a short section of side shell reinforced transversely. And uh, it, it's like you've got a, two strong uh, members joined by a thin flap of steel. So you've got the topside tank. You've got longitudinal members, deck is longitudinally framed. You've got often longitudinals on the side shell. Same thing over here. And, and if you see the hull girder uh, analysis as such is done using these longitudinal members. So you have the deck, you have the sloping plate, side shell, sloping plate again, this longitudinal girder here, and all the longitudinal stiffness. This part is transversely framed. No longitudinal stiffening. You've got, uh, say, a heavy cargo here. You've got water that ranges from this height to this height. So alternately, you have water pressure from outside, and then you have no pressure. So what happens is the, the, the side shell basically starts flapping around. And in the older bulk carriers, when you have uh, the stiffening which has been either corroded away at the connection with the side shell. 
Basically, there's no local stiffening. You have the shell is actually flapping around and there have been instances where a side shell has completely fallen out. And, and this is how it hap happens really. So this is what led to a lot of the holes flooding even with the hatches tight, hatches in place. There was, a, there was a kind of a move to have double skin even for bulk carriers and a lot of bulk carrier designs recently have gone in for it thinking that this might become a requirement but as of now it has not. So uh, there is no requirement for that. This happened much more recently, even after all those uh, things on um, where uh, Erika, Erika was a vessel that, uh, Italian-owned tanker that uh, broke into two in the Bay of Biscay, uh, 31,000 tons of HFO. It was classed, inspected by Port State Control, and 16 times between 91 and 97, it had ISM certification, it was vetted by all majors, including Exxon, Texaco, Standard Marine, Total Fina and Shell, but still it went down. So which led people to really look into what is happening and it was also they looked at what was happening. TOCA stands for Transfer of Class Agreement. This is an agreement between classification societies that if a vessel is uh, underclassed by some society and it wishes to transfer, it stipulated minimum requirements for exchange of information so that it should not happen that owners take advantage of it when they have outstanding recommendations from one class society that when they move to the other, those things should follow them basically so that the vessel remains in a safe condition that all its recommendations are dealt with properly. And limitation of liability because obviously uh, class became one of the bad guys, uh, you know, it's easy target to uh, pinpoint class and say that you have failed because you inspected it. Uh, but then uh, class has a look at this vessel maybe once in a year and it is expected to take responsibility for something like that when it looks at it for just once in a year. Whereas the owner has the vessel continuously under its responsibility. So uh, that's, that's what they meant that we can't make class societies uh, completely liable financially at least because this also led to the enhancement of what was already an enhanced survey program where you looked at uh, tankers, uh, close-up surveys, certain requirements for thickness gauging, all of which came under the enhanced survey. What they came up with was that ballast tanks which are adjacent to heated cargo tanks when you have heated, uh, sorry, heated HFO tanks, it could be cargo or could be could be HFO for the vessel itself. The heat and the moisture creates conditions which are ideal for corrosion, and uh, people have been amazed by what can happen in the space of one year from the last annual inspection. Because what they found was that in Erica, the ballast tanks were not examined annually. However, they did not need to be because they needed to be examined only special, at special surveys and intermediate surveys. So it did not need annual examination, but possibly the condition had deteriorated so much in a space of one year because of the heated cargo tanks. And the other thing that happened was intermediate hull surveys became enhanced to the level of the previous special survey. So basically they found that it's not we are not having a thorough enough look at it. Once in five years is not good enough. So we need to look at it twice in a period of five years to that thorough extent. And of course, this is something, this is not a regulation, but all class societies generally have adopted this, which is to do with uh, having two surveyors attend for tanker, enhanced survey uh, of tankers. Two surveyors, so that you have an independent, it's not like, one surveyor is doing the port side and the other surveyor does the starboard side. No, two surveyors go and they do exactly the same thing so that in case there is a lapse or difference in judgment, the, it is supported by the other person as well. So that was bulkers, uh, tankers, and uh, next we talk of uh, roto vessels. This was a famous picture, you all remember it from 1987, the Herald of Free Enterprise. 
And this happened hardly 200 meters off the pier. So she just left the pier, finished loading, and she starts sailing down. It happened barely to the vessel slowly listed to one side. And the, as you can see, there wasn't even enough water there for it to float sideways. What happened on this was a fairly obvious thing. The bow doors did not close properly. And uh, as the vessel was proceeding, the water rushed in into the vehicle deck. And as you know, the vehicle deck is one long deck. And fairly, it almost encompasses the entire breadth of the vessel. So even if you have something like three inches of water on that vehicle deck, it's a substantial amount of free surface and even a slight list will bring all the water to one side and it's very difficult to recover from that kind of thing. So, I mean, this again looks a very, very obvious thing to us, but it took a disaster like that to bring it into focus and to make us look at, we need to do something here. The doors to vehicle decks are of paramount importance. It's not enough just to have one safety locks. I mean, or to have an one single alarm. It's not enough. So, just to recount uh, what happened, okay, not to, this was even closer, 100 yards from the shore. Crew of 80 and carried 459 passengers, 81 cars, buses, three buses, and 47 trucks. 193 people died. Most of the victims were trapped inside the ship and succumbed to hypothermia because of the frigid water. Highest death toll of any British vessel in peacetime since the sinking of the Lola in 1919. Okay. This, uh, of course, a slew of regulations came into Solas soon after this, but uh, as you, the date there is wrong, it's March 1987, not 97. Soon after this happened, you had another that happened in 1994, where 800 lives were lost, and this was really big. This happened in the heavy seas, cause is not clear, but basically what else can go wrong in a Roro vessel? Even though you had measures regarding the vehicle deck, uh, a slew of other regulatory measures came up as a result of this, and one of the things was the safety management code. Because basically they said that it is not just a question of hull structure and equipment, but safety is also to a large degree a function of how you operate. What sort of systems do you have on board? What, what measures are there that the crew follow on a day-to-day -day basis? Nobody had been looking at that aspect of it. So it was found necessary. And by this time, of course, ISO 9000 was fairly well established ashore in companies, uh, in uh, industries, all over the place. So this was a natural progression from ISO 9000 to having such a management system in place for vessels as well. Not only the shipping company, but there is a management system on board the vessel. So, and its interaction with the company, which is ultimately responsible for safety and, and now security as well, of course. So, uh, what this looked at was passenger ship stability requirements in damaged condition access to Roro decks so that you prohibit, not or prohibit, limit the access to vehicle decks because you don't want any case of sabotage either. So only persons who are authorized can have access to those vehicle decks. Watertight integrity of the Roro deck spaces, that of course, um, which included uh, penetrations, bulkhead deck penetrations, as well as proper drainage, in case of water, it should drain rapidly and, and efficiently. And then the, the design of the doors themselves and its operation. So, uh, so Solas has gone very deeply into detail in this, in this aspect. And uh, this is what came about as a result of this last one. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for the patience.